Just want to make sure that um, I'm on here. Hello, everyone. My name is Tezneem Jamal. I am a novelist and a consulting editor with the New Quarterly. Thank you so much for joining us at the ninth annual Wild Riders Literary Festival. Obviously, this year we are doing things differently in hosting you online from Kitchener Waterloo. While it's disappointing that we can't be together in person, we are grateful that we are, we are able to welcome so many people from across the country. Please make sure to visit our website for the full schedule of events. They run throughout the month of November. First off, I want to say thank you to our festival donors and sponsors. We are grateful for their support of this year's Wild Riders Literary Festival. I'd also like to thank all the volunteers who have made the festival possible. This evening's webinar, inspired by true stories, features Helen Humphreys and Nicole Smith. Nicole Smith is a writer and theater creator based in Cambridge, Ontario. Girls from Away is Nicole's most recent play in progress and is set to premiere in 2021. She is currently working on her first novel. And now I will turn things over to Nicole who will introduce Helen Humphreys. There we go. I think you can hear me now. Yeah, I can hear you. Um, hi, Helen. Hi, Nicole. <laughs> I get to introduce you and uh, you're here already. So now everyone who we can't see will be able to admire you while I read your uh, biography to them. <laughs> <laughs> so Helen Humphreys <laughs> is an acclaimed and award-winning author of fiction, nonfiction, and poetry. Her work includes novels Machine Without Horses, The Evening Chorus, Coventry, and After Image. Her nonfiction includes The Ghost Orchard, The Frozen Thames, as well as the memoir Nocturne. She has won the Rogers Writers Trust Fiction Prize, the Toronto Book Award, and has been a finalist for the Governor General's Award for Fiction, the Trillium Book Prize, the Lambda Literary Award, and CBC Radio's Canada Reads. The recipient of Harborfront Festival Prize for Literary Excellence, Helen Humphreys lives in Kingston, Ontario. A friend of mine always said that, um, Biographies are like your eulogy, but you're alive when you get to listen to it. So you should always just bask in it. Yeah. <laughs> um, and today we get to talk about your latest book, Rabbit Foot Bill. I'm very excited to uh, get to pick your brain about this. So I suppose we should just dive right in. Why not? Um, why not? So how about you, um, how do you feel about, I know this is like the worst question to ask, especially right off the bat, but what's your book about? I was hoping you would be able to tell us just a little bit about the book to put the conversation in context for uh, those, uh, those listening. So uh, what inspired it and how it came about? Yeah, the book is uh, about, it's based on a, a real murder that happened in 1947 in Saskatchewan and then it's also it has to do with uh, the LSD drug trials that happened at the Weyburn Mental Hospital also in Saskatchewan in the late 50s. Um, so it came about because I was approached at a reading about 18 years ago uh, by oh. a man who wanted me to help him with his writing and this was one of the stories he wanted to tell because he knew the person who had committed the murder in this uh, instance. So I helped him for a number of years and he wrote a version, he's written a version of it himself as a short story. But I was really attracted to the character of Rabbit Foot Bill and the idea of, of the story and that relationship between the boy and, and Rabbit Foot Bill. So at some point we just sort of mutually decided that I would just have a run at it as well. And so I did my version, but it had many iterations because the you know, he approached me 18 years ago. And so I, I tried it a bunch of different ways until I came finally on this way. So you've been working on it for that long, for 18 years? Not constantly. Not constantly. On and yeah. off, yeah, yeah. Oh, wow, I had no idea that this was, uh, that this was something that's been ruminating for that long. Well, it was hard to know how to tell the story. That was the problem with it, right? Because it's, a tr it's someone else's story. It's not my story. It's, it's part, mostly, a it's a true story, right? So how much of the true story do I, 
do I tell? How much of, you know, there was like a lot of things to consider. And so it just took a long time to work it out, right? Yeah, well, I'm happy you brought that up because that was actually the next question I was going to ask because, I mean, I'm really interested in why you chose uh, to fictionalize it or why you chose to wrote it, write it as a novel, knowing too that you're, I mean, you're such a prolific writer. You've written nonfiction, you've written fiction, you've written poetry. So um, because this was a true story, I wonder what what made you decide, was it organic? Like, did it just kind of turn into a novel or did you make the decision that it was gonna be a fiction? Yeah, I had to make the decision. So it could have gone either way, right? I could have done it as nonfiction, but when I started to research it, I researched the murder and various things. I found that my friend's recollection of what had happened didn't actually jive with the facts of what had happened, but his recollection was much better <laughs> than the facts. So I thought, well, I'm gonna go with a better story, right? Like all novelists do. And so I, I just went with his memories, which were somewhat false, right? Rather than the actual truth. So. You know, then it just, became a fiction. Then it became yeah. a fi then it became fiction. Yeah. Fiction. yeah. Oh, that's interesting. That's interesting. Yeah. I was Story frozen there. Uh, no. Uh oh, I think. Yeah, you froze and I can't hear you anymore. You am I back? Uh, no, no video, a little bit of audio. Hello. Okay, I can hear you. Can't see you though. My whole shut down. Yeah, it was, you were coming, you were going in and out anyway. It was hard, it was hard for me to hear you in the beginning. That's yeah. really strange. Am I back now? Mm, sort of, but I can't see you. Oh, there you are, okay. But it's still not. You're frozen. Thing up on me too, but I don't know if it's a. Uh, um, okay, somebody's telling me they can see me. I don't know if it's my internet. Sometimes if you're closer to the modem, it works better. Yeah, I don't know if it's, uh, cause you're freezing up on me too, but my, my Zoom keeps shutting down. So yeah. it must be on my end. Uh, am I back? Yeah, you're back, that's better. Okay, that's really strange. Anyway, sorry about that everybody. Um, so I was really excited when I found out that uh, we were going to be um, discussing truth and fiction because I'm fascinated by how thin a line exists between those two things. Mm -hmm. Like to me, truth and a lie is actually, those two things are very closely related. And I think that the thing that determines them is story. So to get to discuss this was exciting to me. And um, just delve into some different areas of some different areas. Of, so I was uh, 
Hey, Nicole, can you hear me? And... Hey, Nicole, can you hear me? Could you perhaps turn off your video and just join us via audio? Sometimes that works. That works better. It's a little bit less strain on your internet connection there. Sure. These are the times of Zoom. Thank you everyone so much for your patience. <laughs> Okay, while we are just waiting for Nicole to come back and join us, hopefully she's just able to join us with audio and maybe not video. Tazneem, could I invite you back on screen for a minute? Everybody's gone. <laughs> I know we're all alone here. Yeah, can you hear me? Hold on. It says unable to start video. Uh, oh, I think you have to you have to free that up yeah. for me. Okay, mm -hmm. okay. But you can hear me. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and I've just uh, prompted you to start your video there, just okay. All right. I'm here. You're not alone. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Mm -hmm. Okay. It looks like Nicole's maybe having some difficulties joining us. Mm -hmm. So I'm just going to do some quick um, troubleshooting and I could just hand the conversation over to you for a minute, Tazneem. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I, I, haven't, I haven't read the book, Helen, yet. I, they asked me to do this really recently, so I, I, I absolutely want to, but I, the subject of um, Real stories and fiction are quite close to my heart. Um, that, that is what I wrote about in, in my uh, first novel and in the novel I'm working on right now, I'm, I'm doing the same thing. And, and um, I, think, I think what Nicole was beginning to talk to you about uh, the, the question of, or the, the kind of not clear distinction between truth and fiction mm -hmm. that goes on in the process is, is something I think about um, a lot. Um, and I'm curious uh, when you are when you are in the process of uh, whether it's writing a scene or sort of formulating a character. Is there is there um, is there a starting point? And I, I'll tell you how I do it. I'll, 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 the, there might be a scene or a situation that I, from my memory or that I I witnessed. So that to me is real is true. Uh, on, on that level, uh, and then I'll begin. I'll begin there, but then it takes on a life of its own. And uh, I would say at that point is when I fictionalize. And I wonder if, what kind of process you have when you take something that is uh, essentially a true story, and then um, and then moves on into fiction. Well, I kind of think that anything, as soon as you put it down on the page, becomes fictionalized, whether mm -hmm. it's true or not. Like just the process in the process you're choosing what to present and what weight to give things. And, you know, you, you're making an order of something that might've had a different order. So, so you're already manipulating whatever you thought of to be, you know, truth in the beginning. So, um, yeah, so I just, you know, I'm always looking for the best story and the best way through the story. So, which is why I chose to do this book as, as fiction and not a, a sort of nonfiction because the, there was I could do a better job with the story by fictionalizing elements of it but you know the, I don't know it's um I, I kind of think all writing is fiction in a way well, <laughs> right, right. Yeah, yeah yeah same yeah. I mean even yeah. even as when I phrased the question and I described it as a memory I mean that that's a fiction a fiction yeah. you know I mean so so it I do find that it's it's it is such a blurring um from the beginning but I just wondered in the in the process if there was any sort of point at which, I don't know, if someone were to say to you, did that, you know, did that happen? Is that a real person? Is that based on a real person? Um, how, how do you, how, how do you answer that? 
because I, I do get that question and I'm just sort of curious how you would. Yeah, I mean, I say it's based on a real event, you know, when I talk about this book and somebody's memories of a real event, mm -hmm. but, you know, it's, it's, it's also a work of fiction. So, yeah, you know, that's usually what I say based on is a good phrase, right? It covers a yes. lot. Yes, yes, yes. yes. <laughs> I see Nicole. I um, think Nicole might be back. She's Is back. Are you back? I hope so. Oh, <laughs> yeah. <Yay. laughs> okay. I'm sorry. I don't know uh, what uh, what's happening, but All hopefully right. that, yeah. that this hopefully this is for for keeps. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm I'm here uh, to sort of uh, back up if you need. So I'll I'll, I'll let you guys take over. Okay. Thank you. All right. <laughs> okay. Great. Thank you. Um. Hi. <laughs> hi. <laughs> Okay, so I wanted to talk about um, the kind of truth of your everyday as a human and how or whether that rubs into your rubs off into your writing at all. There's a quote by I think it's Flaubert, um, but it's be regular and ordinary in your life so that you may be violent and original in your work. And I wonder if you consider at all, like sort of the truth of you as a writer and how that might affect the fiction that you create. That's a pretty good, that's a big question. Um, I know, just to <laughs> dive yeah, right in now. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. But yeah, I think it has, there's a lot of, there's a lot of overlap, especially as I, as I get older, there's more and more overlap. I think, I think the tendency, I don't know if it's true for other writers, but the tendency as I get older is to um, not want to have so much distinction between what's fictional and what's what's my own life, right? There's just a lot of kind of blending things together. Mm. So, so yeah, I put a lot of of my kind of everyday in one way or another into what I'm writing. Most right. of my everyday, you know, these days because I have a young dog, it revolves around going outside to exhaust the dog, which is a like, monumental project. <laughs> which I can't believe how long it takes. So I just- To exhaust a puppy, yeah. <laughs> so um, there's a lot of nature, right, that seeps in. And I think that's what's happening is like the nature kind of seeps into the fiction of it. That's because I'm out in it all the time and I'm noticing things and yeah. Yeah, no, well, that was, that. that's bang on because that's kind of my next question too because I feel like if you're talking about truth I mean nature is kind of as true or as close to truth that you can really get um is there something that you learn about writing or art specifically from nature I know that you have written a lot about nature or or you've been inspired by nature but is there something that you learn about the craft of writing itself uh through that kind of being surrounded by that kind of truth? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think, yeah, of course, because different things, you know, you could be doing the same thing. I, I was thinking about this the other day. You could be doing the same walk, which I mm -hmm. mostly do every day. Mm -hmm. And every day something different will cross your path, right? The weather will be different. You know, just all these things will be different. So so even in something with that rigid a structure, there's so much kind of freedom that happens inside it, right? And so if you think about writing, it's that same kind of thing. It's like you, you, you can make a structure, but you have a lot, like Flaubert says, you can do a lot inside something that, that is sort of contained. So, so totally. I think, that, yeah, I think that, and just, just being aware, just being, it, it, uh, being, being out in nature a lot teaches you to be a good observer, right? Which is a good thing for writing just to be able to yes. notice what's around you and make sense of yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's um, Anne Bogart, who's a, who's a theater director. Um, and she always says to observe is not a passive verb. And mm -hmm. I think about that a lot because I think it's, it's, it speaks to something reciprocated too. Um, like the thought of, there's been studies too, and I forget the book title, but there was an author who did uh, a bunch of studies into water and actual water molecules and put them in different kind of scenarios where people spoke good things to them or like good music, yeah. classical music was played oh, and I it actually that. changed. Yeah, right. Yeah. And it actually changed the molecules themselves. So speaking about truth and fiction too, I wonder about like, what do you think about 
the act of interpretation or do you think the so you have the act of observation but i wonder about the act of interpretation and whether that has any power to change that truth itself or the thing itself yeah of course because interpretation is subjective isn't it well so it's observation really i suppose i mean True. right so it's all subjective True. so i i see something i make a decision about it that's just subjective isn't it but in that in that in that kind of you know thing that i make out of that i i guess that you you get you know my observations and my you know interpretations if they're interesting to anybody else but yeah i guess that's where it becomes personal right yeah 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 because i mean exactly. everybody like 10 different people could go for the same walk and everybody could see different things and think different things about them right right so i like i mean what i like to do though is just to kind of sustained observation because you can change your mind about things so if you're looking at the same thing you know, day after day, you notice different things about it over time and you think differently about it. And that I think can be trusted. That's a sort of more, um, I guess, more in a way more scientific approach. Because it's yeah. a kind of repeated observation. That's exactly right. It's almost like a placeholder of time in a way too. I think it was Anne-Marie MacDonald who said, um, um, I'm paraphrasing the quote, but it's like that there are some stories you can't hear enough because, every time you read them, they're the same, but you've changed. And that's one reliable way of understanding time. Yeah. Uh, it's something along those lines. And I that's think good. that's that ties in a lot to what you're saying. Um, so talking about this idea of how close, I think this is what I was getting at before I cut out last time, but how closely related truth, fiction, story, lie, memory, um, all of these kinds of words, imagination, hope, like to me, a lot of these things are very, they're almost all the same if you really give it thought. And I wonder if you thought about the inter, like, so talking, sorry, I'm jumping all over, but when I think about rabbit foot bill, and you can definitely correct me if I'm wrong, but I kind of think about it in three sort of sections. And it's almost like the first bit you're seeing something you're you're witnessing something it's like almost as true as you're going to get because it's right in front of your face you're witnessing something happening and as as the narrator is witnessing it in the second bit which is kind of the institution bit in my head it's like the his interpretation of what's kind of happened and in the third bit to me you're going into memory and his memory of something which which gives you more truth or more insight to truth. So again, those things are all closely related, but sort of interchangeable. And I wondered if while you were writing this and structuring it out, you thought of those distinctions at all or thought about the interchangeability of those kinds of things. Yeah, I wanted to, I mean, I wanted the book to kind of um, have at its center that one thing that happens very early on in the book, I don't want to say what it is in case people haven't yeah, read it or will read sure. it, but there is one thing that happens just early on and then it kind of determines a lot of what happens what later. Happens. So I wanted that and I wanted, you know, because when something happens um, that's traumatic, we, we, we circle back and look at it a lot of different ways, right? Over time and through different circumstances. So, so I wanted to sort of deal with that, I guess. And the LSD part is, is just, um, you know, all those things really happened. They were doing all those experiments. It was very interesting. I, I thought yeah, narratively that whole segment of our, of our history, but also the idea of um, just the altered perception, right? So, so there's an altered perception with the drug and, and looking at an event with altered perception as well as like with memory and, and everything. So, so it was about sort of just lo of looking at something that ha happened and figuring out how to how to deal with it, I guess, is, is what happens to the character over the course of the book. Right. And so right. so therefore you kind of go close to it and you go away from it, you circle it, you come back, you, you try a different approach, right? Like we all do with something that happened to us. I mean, That's right. Yeah. It's almost like restructuring or rewriting your story or your memory in a way that that makes it like that's what was 
so powerful to me about it is this notion of just that attempt and that willingness to do that, to try and, and make yourself better, I guess, for lack of a better word. Yeah, that's what I want the book to be about, it, it, you know, it, is that, that the um, desire to heal, to heal yourself from trauma, whatever trauma, we all have right. trauma, and, and just that desire to heal yourself and to try to heal is a really powerful and kind of beautiful act, right? And, th and that I wanted it to be, you know, about that. But I was gonna say too about sometimes when something happens, especially in childhood, you can't really get a good look at it till adulthood. Mm. And sometimes there's parts of it you, you have buried, right? And, and that you don't, they don't surface until later on anyway. So, so we don't, you never see the whole thing entirely, right. necessarily anyway, you only see a piece of it, right? And then, and right. then maybe you see another piece of it and then you have to connect the pieces up and, and make, and make all, something. Yeah, and so our, like our, our lives in a way are just these puzzles that we're trying to solve all the way through. And maybe we solve some of it, then probably not all of it, yeah. I, yeah, I think there's like great terror in that <laughs> and great freedom, yeah. <laughs> depending on how you look at it, I guess, because, you know, if nothing's true, everything is, and if everything is, nothing is, and really it's about what, what you're deciding to take action to create from the pieces that you have, kind of like what you're talking about. Yeah, that's right, and what you can do with it. Yeah, yeah. Um, so funnily enough, for me, um, a lot of the truth of the story and a lot of the truth of a character comes out for me in specifics in the book. And I, I also won't get into specifics in case people haven't read it. But I mean, like little details, like you learn a lot about Bill, for example, when you when you describe his water glass and flashlight beside his bed. For me, all of a sudden, it opens up who this person is. I get a very clear picture of that from a tiny detail that you've presumably made up. So it's interesting to me, too, that truth can be a kind of truth can be relayed in something that is made up. And in the first conversation of this festival, um, Amanda Leduc talked about um, her book, Disfigured. And there's a quote in that, which I really love, where she says, stories make space for difference. When you make something inconceivable into a story, suddenly it gains legitimacy. Suddenly it operates in the realm of possibility. And I loved that a lot. And it made me think about do you feel you have to be careful in the fictionalization of truth, like particularly other people's truths in this case? What's the responsibility of the writer in that regard? I can't speak for all writers, but I can speak for myself. Um, yes. Yeah, I had to weigh everything up, right? I had to think, that's why it took 18 years to write this book. <laughs> I had to really think about how to tell the story so that I was doing justice to the person, Hugh Lefebvre, whose story it was. And also, um, you know, that I was making an interesting story for readers. It, like, and what, and it, it could be taken a different way. I spent a lot of, some of those years trying to make, figure out a kind of redemptive path through the story. I wanted it to be, mm -hmm. because it's not a particularly, it's quite a bleak story if you look at it in one way. And I didn't want to look at it just in that way. Just mm -hmm. really for my, I just thought, why do I want to put something that's just unremittingly bleak out there? I don't want to do that. So I had to find a path through the story that gave it a kind of, you know, redemptive quality to it. Yeah. yeah so there's lots of, there's lots of things to think about. You know, it's, it's, it's just like writing a novel is a series of decisions that you make, but you each decision you think about endlessly because right. you're, tr you're right. You're trying to, think is this the right decision if I if I did this instead what would happen and it's all this working out of probability so we go through every you know there's nothing I think that you don't think about when you're writing a novel it's, it's just the it's part and it takes ages to do the actual writing itself so yeah. yeah and did you feel like at a certain point well I guess too you said that uh the person you were talking to I mean the story it was his memory of it too. So yeah. I guess at a certain point you do feel you have to 
you have to jump away from that account and fictionalize it. Yeah, but also stay as emotionally true to it. I tried to stay emotionally right. true to it as I could, right? I tried, to stay, I, I tried to stay true to his emotions around his relationship with this, this man who was a real person. And um, so that's, that's sort of what I tried to do. Even if I strayed in the, de in the, in the, the actual details into more fictionalized, the fictionalized world, emotionally, I, start, I tried to, to stay close to what he, he told me he had felt or was feeling. Right. So. Yeah, that totally makes sense. Um, I was going to ask, um, and that, I've jumped all over the place because of our Zoom uh, snafu there. Um, but would you like to read a little bit for sure. us? Sure. Okay. Yeah, I will. I'll just read um, maybe a couple of pages just from the beginning, I think. So this, is right, this is uh, right from the beginning. And um, all you need to know is uh, the narrator is a 12 year old boy called Leonard, and it's 1947, and it's Canwood, Saskatchewan. Bill never likes to leave town the same way twice. He strides out with an urgency I find hard to match. He leads me through the tamarack woods. He leads me through the meadow bog. He leads me through the tall prairie grasses. He leads me across the swift shallow river. I usually have to run to keep him in my sight. We have been friends for a year, Bill and I, and although people don't approve, we are friends anyway. I like that Bill isn't bothered by what people say. Mostly he is just worried that someone will follow him out of town and see where he lives. The reasons why people don't like my being friends with Bill are these. First, because he is a man and I'm a 12 year old boy. And second, because he is a man who is not like other men. He doesn't talk much. He doesn't live in a house. He doesn't have a real job. He doesn't have a family. People say he's slow, but as I've already said, I have to run to keep up with him. No one blames me for the friendship. They see it as Bill's doing, but really it is me who pushed for it. I followed him around on the days when he sold his rabbit's feet in town or did odd jobs for Mrs. Odegaard. I hounded him with questions. I fetched him water when he was hot and thirsty. I wore him down with my attentions so that now he's used to having me around. Why do you want to befriend a tramp? Asks my father. And I can't tell him why. I can't explain this feeling of running after Bill under the long blue prairie sky. It is like he is leading me out of darkness, out of a loneliness I don't even know I have. I'll stop. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> did you read, did you, you have an audiobook for that, for, for this novel, don't you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did you read it? Mm -hmm. I didn't. I read it. <laughs> no, a man named Christopher, somebody read it. Okay, yes, that makes yeah. sense. Yeah. <laughs> that it would be a man reading it. Yeah. <laughs> that was beautiful. Thank you for that. Um, so how much power do you feel personally that we have over our own stories? And do you think that that differs from how much power we have over our own truths? Hmm. <laughs> Is, aren't they one and the same? It's true. I think so. Yeah, I mean, I would say so. I, I yeah. wouldn't think my, any story of mine is different from any truth. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, is it power? I don't know that we have power over anything, mm -hmm. really, right? Mm -hmm. Don't we just meet our memories at a particular moment and we understand them at that moment as being one thing and then another moment there's something else? So yes. I think things are shifting all the time. And I think it's a, it's it's... A mistake to ever think we have control or power over anything because I don't think we do if we're if we're aware and awake in the world everything is changing all of the time and all you can do is try to be in the you know be in the moment you're in and meet that moment and then there's going to be another moment right after it that's different so mm -hmm. I think that's kind of how I feel about it I feel that we understand some things about our lives at a particular moment and then and then that moment can change and, and the that understanding changes into some other understanding it's, so it's very uh it's very shifting it's very fluid yeah. i guess yeah i totally agree with that 
I wanted to, um, the reason why I'm asking you that is because I wanted to quote you from your book. <laughs> is that weird? <laughs> if I read a quote a that weird. you've written yeah. to you? <laughs> <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Well, it's, it's about midway through and you talk about what could have been a happy ending yeah, if, right. the, yeah. if the yeah. events would have just ended there. And mm -hmm. so that's what made me ask the question because I think about that a lot. Like I agree completely with what you're saying, which is that things are always shifting. And I think you have power to do what you can within that moment or within that constraint, but that is really where you have the power and what you can do with what's coming at you. So. Is it power though, or is it awareness? Like, right? I, I would probably think of it being as more about being uh, as awareness. So you have awareness yes. in that moment. That's a great way of putting it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. It's what's seeping in. And, and that whole thing, yeah. And that whole thing about the happy ending thing is that is that in all of our stories, in all of our lives, in in all of our relationships, whatever, there are are optimum places where if if that relationship had stopped there or this event had stopped here or something, that would have been a really great place for it to stop. That would have been, you know, kind of the right, the height of happiness or right. the height of something. But unfortunately, everything just kind of keeps rolling on usually regardless, and sometimes you go past the place in a, in a relationship, a story, your own life, that was the kind of optimum place. And, and I, I just sort of, and sometimes you recognize it, right? And, and you think, oh, it's never gonna be as good as this again. And I recognize this, so that's the kind of <laughs> thing yeah, to be aware well, of, right? That's almost like an ultimate truth there, too right I think because it's like you talk about truth and story when you're talking about that all of a sudden I'm thinking about the Titanic and one of my friends was taught the movie I mean one of my friends was talking about how uh you know Rose I mean Jack has to die spoiler alert for anyone who hasn't seen the Titanic but Jack has to die at the end because that's that's where people want that ending to be because if he survived you'd be watching like their marital issues and you'd be watching like all of these other all of these other truths that in this pretty bow of a story even though it's tragic with his death you don't want to delve into so anyway to me that relates to what you're talking about here which is life <laughs> yeah it does go on <laughs> life does yeah it does go on and sometimes it's though. not it's not as good as what came before right although yeah. he would have lived so for, probably for him that would be better <laughs> right, right? <laughs> his story would have been a little better <laughs> if he'd been able to get off that raft and... <laughs> yes <laughs> but, good <yeah>. point <laughs> um okay so i'm gonna go over here because there's quite a few um questions from people who are not me, who would probably like to ask you things. Uh, I'm just opening it up here. Technology. Uh-oh. Okay, uh, this is from Tannis McDonald. Helen, I really like your statement that the repeated walk and sustained observation operate in the realm of the scientific method to see differently because of the repeated route. I pretty much want you to talk about writing about place for the rest of the night, but I'll settle <laughs> for this. <laughs> what challenges to writing place have you encountered in writing this novel or others? Hmm. That's a good one. Mm -hmm. um, I guess when I think about place, like I often think about two things about place. I think what is public and what is private in a place, right? What does everybody see? And what does only the specific people see? And I guess that's always my, my uh, not a problem, but it's always a concern is to how much of one to show and how much of the other to show, right? If you, if you, 
like you have to show a sort of broader range of something to get everybody, I'm talking about novels now, to get readers to be able to see the place. But there's also the hidden, the hidden place that only certain characters see. So how much of that do you show, right? Like how much of you do sort of a bigger, more objective thing and how much is subjective, I guess. So I, I think that's probably something I think about a lot in, and mm -hmm. in writing too. And, and also when I'm writing specifically for myself about a place, how much of my subject, my subjective, my subjective um, experience of the place is going to be interesting to other people, right? I mean, it might not be very interesting if I'm just talking about the same acorn for 15 days, right? for somebody else but for me it might be fascinating so it's that I always have to you know it's always thinking about that how much of the what's in, sort of intensely private do you do you reveal and and how much do you go to a kind of a wider landscape mm -hmm. what's the balance mm -hmm. between the two right that's kind of a never-ending question yeah that's so true I wonder does um does I know that you often in, after your walks will draw, will take things and, and draw them. Does that play part in that thought process at all? Or is that a totally different kind of meditative thing that you do? No, it's attached to it because yeah. I'm, yeah, I'm looking for something or it's something I kind of come across something and then you have to think about it a lot because when you draw, you know, it's, it's kind of, um, it's really, somebody described it, I remember who now, but it's like um, it's showing thinking, right? So the thought process mm. is made visible when you draw. You move at a certain speed that it's about the thinking speed of your brain. So yeah, it's all part of the same. It's all part of the same thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, honestly, I could just spin everything out of my. I, I mean, maybe there'll be a point in my life where all I do is like go on the walk and then just spend <laughs> the rest of the time like disseminating it, right? <laughs> Oh but, yeah, that's awesome. But I'd be kind of into that. I mean, I always like those <laughs> books that are very obsessive about like one thing or, you know, I'm, I'm always, I'm always drawn to that myself. Yeah, totally. Me too. It's like the micro versus, yeah, the, versus the macro. Like that. Yeah. 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 That's neat. Okay. Um, this is from Mary McDonald. Does the true story inhibit the telling of the fictional story, i.e. allowing your characters enough rain? Hmm. Yeah, I, I ran into a lot of, um, yeah, I, I, went, I went through a process where I was, I felt hampered by the true story. You know, I had to like, I, and, I, and I, went in, I went into the true story in research. So I got the court transcripts for the trial that happened and I, I did a lot of digging for things. So it kind of hampered me in a way um, because I always knew it was, you know, these, things had ha happened, how was I going to integrate it, right? So I wanted to integrate some of it. I did actually integrate quite a lot of it because I used sort of stuff from the court transcripts and the trial, things that were documented that I could trust as being, um, you know, as far close to the truth as, as there was because they were this sort of legal thing where people's, um, you know, things they said were documented and written down. So, so I did try to integrate that's what that's what I tried to do. But again, I was it was like how how what to integrate and and then also my friend's memories, you know, what to use of his that was true and what to use that that was actually turned out not to be true. So it was just this constant, it was it was a hard book to write in that way because I was constantly trying to shuffle things around and figure out what mm -hmm. how to how to do it, how to tell the story. And that's, that's sort of why it took so long. And I did a bunch of versions of it. Like this is maybe version number five or six so so it took and a do while. they differ they really differ. yeah they do differ yeah. and it, it just took a while to, to work it out yeah had you known about the story before he brought it to your attention no, like no. the true story no because no, it's a very small place canwood saskatchewan right. doesn't have very many people in it and it was a something that happened in 1947 and you know, right, right. Very localized. It wasn't a big sensational thing. It was just a very localized just a just right. story. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay, so this is from an anonymous attendee. Machine Without Horses was a remarkably creative interplay using history to generate creative fictions and merge imagined stories with nonfiction writing about your core character and your process. Very unusual and successful in format. 
Might you compare that book with your new novel or with the Frozen Thames where history prompted imagined vignettes? Hmm. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I guess it's all my imagination at play. So, so there's always, there's gonna be some similarity between my projects, I, I think, I guess. I, I assume that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, it makes sense. So probably that's that's what that is. That that I like the past. I mean, I do like dealing with history because I like to imagine myself into it. It's there's lots of hooks there to to sort of get me going and get me thinking. Um, but yeah, but I also like to kind of come out of it in a way too. So it, it was nice. Machine Without Horses was for me a really great book to write because I got to sort of write about my process. And I wanted to really show what I did to make a novel in case anybody cares. But <laughs> just because that process is often not talked about very much by novelists, you know, they, they sort of, sometimes no, they right. say things that, oh, it was the muse, or they have these vague answers for what they do. And it annoyed me that they did. That. I thought, no, no, I, I know what I do. I, like you, you have to, you do these mm. certain things and I'm gonna, I'm gonna just lay it out and just, just do that, so. Yeah, anyway, I don't know if that was the answer to the question, but I, I guess it's just the interest in history and the overlap of, of that and in my books. Yeah, yeah, and how that would, it makes sense that that would come through in, in your work because it's you. It's me, yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> okay, Leanne Charette is asking, you mentioned wanting to find a path to redemption in your novel so that it wasn't all bleak. Can you share any of your process in finding that redemption and hope amid the bleakness? Mm. Yes, <laughs> I can. Um, the events that the events that happen in the novel are pretty are pretty bleak events. I mean, it is ba it's based on a murder. Uh, I, can, I said that already, so I can say that again. And then there's other things that happen that are equally uh, kind of bleak. So mm -hmm. so to turn that into something to, with while still dealing with the gravity of what it was, but to turn it into something else was difficult. But then when I was looking at the book and thinking, well, what is it really about underneath all that? And it's really about how people try to recover from trauma. And once I, once I kind of got onto that trajectory, I thought, well, that's, that is redemptive like that. And that's a life that's that's about life. That's about choosing life, right? If you want to try to heal yourself, it's about choosing life. And so I could, then I could sort of turn the dial up on that, which is what mm -hmm. I did, right? And and turn the. I mean, I, I mean, all the other stuff stays the same. The events are the same events, and they're not happy. They're tragic events, but mm -hmm. how people respond to them and deal with them and think about them can be can be a, a more positive thing, right? So that's. That's what I did. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but it took a while to get there because uh, the first couple of iterations of the book were the bleak iteration, and and then it was just like, oh, I don't know, I don't, you know, I don't, I don't want to write that book and put that out there. Yeah, yeah. Fine. The I, I love the world's so hard, right? And I don't want to put it out, the, a hard thing. No, the notion of choosing life, like I think that that's. That's bang on. That's really succinctly at the heart of it. And that totally makes sense that that would then be the thing that you chose to bring out. Yeah. <clears throat> um, Kim Fauner is wondering, uh, given the length of time it took, oops. Given the length of time it took you to write this book, how did it feel when you finally finished writing it? Yeah, kind of a letdown, really, I think. <laughs> take, it had taken so long, so it wasn't very, I don't know, it wasn't, it, yeah, it, it was just a bit of a, a nothing. In it. I mean, not a nothing, but it wasn't wildly exciting. You know, books that I have written faster, I'd be more excited about because it's fast, right? It's quick. You're still, you're still with them. You're still experiencing them. But this one, I had puzzled over it for so long that by the time it kind of came to a conclusion, I was done with it, so yeah. That makes sense, that makes sense. Um, Sandra Kenyon, do you use an outline when you are writing or do you work from your instinct? I'm always interested as I go back and forth between the two methods and they both frustrate me. 
<laughs> <laughs> yeah, I do. I, I, I like to have some sort of a, an outline or a plan. I like to know where I'm going. So I like to, I would like to know the ending, what I'm working towards. If you, yeah, I think I, for me anyway, if you can know that it's very helpful because if you're not just sort of writing off the cliff into a vast infinite whatever, and you're writing towards a specific thing you know has to happen for the ending, I think that really helps. You don't even need perhaps much of an outline for the rest of it if you have an ending in mind. So mm -hmm. I usually work with a kind of a loose outline where I know roughly where things are gonna happen. And then uh, that changes a lot in the process of writing. I don't like to have too strict an outline because then you're just, you're just kind of stuck in these little cages all the way along. And there's a lot of stuff that happens organically when you write a book and then you move in a direction or, you know, this, so I want to have the space for that to happen, but I do like to sort of know the ending that, that I, I would think and, and work towards that. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense because I feel like while what you were talking about before with writing a novel being a series of making decisions and that being able to go off in a bajillion different directions, really like, having at least one decision made and kind of a big one, knowing that it can shift makes sense. It gives you some kind of direction to work towards. Yeah. So. And often you pull out things later on, like, like, like the way it took me a lot of iterations before I figured out the book was, could actually be about healing from trauma, you know? So mm. some of that stuff will happen in, in other, re, in different rewrites or, or when you sit with the book for a while, but when you're doing that first draft, it's really important, I think, to just get things down, doesn't even matter if they're in the wrong order and work towards some sort of ending, but get a kind of natural pacing down, get all the things you wanna say down somehow, you know, run with the feeling you have until you, it, it runs itself out because that's, that's mm -hmm. an always a really important thing. Mm -hmm. and, just, and then mm -hmm. you can fix a lot in, in rewriting. So don't worry, I would, don't worry too much. I don't I try not to worry too much in the first draft, but, but it is a kind of just, you need to have something to work from. So you just try to get it down. And I like, right. I, I always like it if I can write a first draft fast. That's always, oh yeah? That's, yeah, because then you're staying with the same feeling. You're not changing your mind. You know, you're not changing how you feel about things. It's all coming out in that, in that same sort of, with the same energy and the same. Yeah. Yeah, so, that, so it's, yeah, anyway, it's better. I find it better. Do you work on more than one thing at once? No, not usually. No. No. Yeah. That not, makes a good, sense too. not a good multitasker. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But that makes sense too in what you're talking about, having that kind of energy spilled into one focus. You know, yeah. if you're starting a whole other thing, that's a lot. <laughs> yeah, because it's obsessive really, right? Writing, some of that part of writing is obsessive. You have to be kind of obsessed about something and you can't, it's pretty hard to be obsessed about a lot of things simultaneously. <laughs> Yes, that makes sense. Um, how do you bear what you know and see and process it into your written works? Uh, well, I'm usually hanging it on a story. So mm -hmm. that's how that, how, that's how that works. So even, mm -hmm. you know, so that makes things easier. You're not just writing. I mean, I might be writing about my own emotions, but I'm putting it out of someone else's story. So it, it that makes it easier. I'm not just writing about my own feelings and my own things all the time, but mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's easier to hang something on a story because a story is a sort of a, a puzzle and it, it's something kind of removed from you, even if you're investing it with your own feelings. So it's, that makes it, that's easier, I think. And you can see it. Yeah, like so it. at a remove, right? Yes, yes. Uh, Rebecca Higgins, your prose is so clean and precise in this book, as always. Did that take time to develop or has that always been your way? Uh, I think, I think, I think that's mostly just been how I've written, I think. I think because I started with poetry, I, I wrote three books of poetry before I wrote a novel. I was good at brevity from poetry, you know, saying, sort of most in the least amount of space. That's what poetry you know, does. So I think that was really good training. And I, and I think that's, I've, 
tried to just say things, yeah, clearly and, and concisely, really, I guess. So I think that's just probably my training in poetry, really. That did yes. that. Yeah. that makes sense, too. Um, I wanted to start these Q and A's early because I knew a lot of people had questions for you. Uh, there's two more, so we'll see if we can get through in the five minutes we have left. Okay. Uh, when you are writing about a place that is not a place that you are intimately familiar with, how do you create that sense of place for the reader, considering that details of place, context, manner are huge in creating a sense of truth in a fictional work? What's your process? This is a place I'm not familiar with or a place I am not familiar with? Yes, when you are writing about a place that is not a place you are intimately familiar with. Right. Um, so I have to, usually I find commonalities. This is how I deal with lots of things that when I'm writing. So I'll find something that I do know something about, right? Um, and then I'll start from there and I can move it out. So so it's not all imagined, but like if I if I know about let's just say it's a landscape and I'm familiar with a particular tree in that landscape I'll start with that tree because I know something about that tree and then I can kind of move out into the things I'm less familiar with by through the thing that I am familiar with so I, it's always about looking for commonalities and then and then moving from there yeah yeah, yeah. that makes sense okay one more uh yes one more I think do you ever use real names or is every name in fiction fictionalized rabbit foot bill's real is um, it yeah i know i use i use some real names sometimes so yeah if it's not all fictionalized yeah. <laughs> i wouldn't have guessed that uh oh there's another one but from amanda bishop if you're writing a fast first draft about a historical character would you recommend doing the research first or afterward and then layering it back in? I would do it. I would do a bit first just so you don't make any terrible mistakes. Like, you know, you said something in the wrong time, whatever. But I wouldn't do, <laughs> I wouldn't do all of it first. And I would do some uh, while you're doing it, if, if it's possible. And then I would do afterwards because you're gonna, do, you're gonna be, end up doing a few drafts anyway. So you can always, there's always time and space in which to do the research then. But I think the thing with the first draft, the important thing is the energy that you have and the, and the excitement about writing that particular book. That's what you want to get down on paper. And, and that's what's going to make the narrative exciting for the reader. So we don't want to spend, you know, a year or two mired in historical detail and then you've lost some of the impetus for writing. So I would just sort of do it, you know, throughout and afterwards, mostly. Right, right. I think that that uh, wraps everything up. I don't think we have time for another one here. Um, and we don't have any more anyway, we got to everybody, which is great. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay, thanks, Nicole. Thank you for your questions. Oh, yeah, pleasure. Thank you, Helen and Nicole. That was that was great. It's wonderfully insightful conversation about fiction, truth, creativity, nature, the fluidity of it all, and great questions, everyone. I really, really enjoyed that Q&A. Um, in closing, I want to remind our viewers that Rabbit Foot Bill, a novel, is available for purchase online from Wordsworth Books in Waterloo. The link to this online ordering is in the Q&A window of your screen or can be found at wildwriters.ca. Uh, also a reminder that this session, like most of our events at the festival, has been provided free of charge. And if you feel compelled to donate in support of the festival, you will find a link to do so on the festival website. Uh, this session has been recorded and will be available throughout the festival if you want to view it again. Um, and don't forget, the next Wild Riders Literary Festival event is Youth Writing, an interactive workshop series with Aaron Bow and Heather Smith. It will take place on Saturday, November 7th from 11 a.m. to 12 p.m. I hope you can join us for that. Um, and thank you, everyone. Thank you for attending tonight's session. <laughs>